There is a new Jacques Mousse show and there is so much more to this than just what you see on the runway. So much more than just the French flag in the final three looks. The show is titled Le Chouchou, which is casual French for scrunchy or anything that is scrunched up. So like this would be a chouchou, but also this is chouchou and maybe this even is chouchou. The point is it's not a hard and fast noun that refers to a single concrete thing. It is uh, a little bit more abstract, a lifestyle, if you will. I can't wait for all of the American high school students in French 2 coming into the comments like, Shushu is a noun, and actually, it the show took place at the Grand Canal at Versailles, which is behind the big famous luxurious palace out front. You may have seen this building before in the movies. When Simone Port Jacquemus met with the team at Versailles initially, it was thought to be impossible for him to be able to show there. And that's understandable. I mean, he's not one of the most powerful French fashion houses like Dior and Chanel have both shown there. Dior actually showed there fairly recently. Point is that Versailles is not a, uh, a facility you can just rent out. Simone's brand is just 14 years old. They're not a established immortal symbol of luxury French fashion but that's what they would like to become. So getting Versailles is a step in that direction. It's kind of a rite of passage de la mode. Light change. We had to change the lighting because the light wasn't working. This 45 look collection was shown off calendar to an audience that was contained entirely in little tiny boats. And Vogue told us recently that Versailles was actually the first date for Jacques Mousse and his now husband, Marco. It was also the first place where Jacques Mousse thought, I should do a show here. Okay, so this collection is heavily based on historic fashion and we're about to, to jump into it, so buckle up. The opening look as well well as a few other looks are an ode to the robe à la française, a historic way of dressing. Welcome to the episode within an episode called How Your Mom's 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 Mom Dressed. But first you're gonna come with me. Oh, this room is weird. Why are we in this room? I've never been inside this room before. You've just seen this part of this room. But now you see the whole thing. Listen, can you all join my Patreon, please? We're, we're running a business over here and uh, I gotta say, it's going really well. A lot better than I expected. When I first started this channel, my dad was like, well, son, do you think this could possibly be a career for you? And I was like, ha, ha, I am not holding my breath. Join it up, get the benefits. We have tons more interviews. Also a huge like old wardrobe tour that I did. There's a shit ton of stuff on there. It costs three bucks. Three bucks is how you get started on it. And that price is going up soon, by the way. Get in while you can. Patreon.com slash I love you a lot. Bye. Welcome back to the episode within an episode titled How Do Your Mom's Mom Blah Blah Blah. Okay, so women used to get dressed with just a shit ton of layers and we're gonna go into all of them in a second. But for now, if you were really, really rich, there would be this one really ornate piece that you would put on top of everything. They were made to be so, so ornate to demonstrate the beauty and sheer amount of fabric that was required to create them and subsequently the wealth of the person wearing it. These ensembles essentially were meant to say, I'm not not calling anyone a broke ass bitch, but check out how much fabric I can afford. Most famously worn by the wealthy, no one understands me, Queen of France, Kirsten Dunst. But Jacques Mousse transforms the outer gown of a robe à la française into a sheer and dainty floor length like vest almost, done in a see-through lace. And this, I guess, is as good a time as any for me to tell you about these cool things that we're having to add to the photos and the videos. Here's the deal, folks. Um, we don't make a lot of money from YouTube at all, which is why that Patreon's so important, but the these black bars literally have to be here. Uh, YouTube says in their terms of service that we are allowed to put up nudity as long as it's part of art. Um, this is art. Folks, and also there is nothing wrong with women's bodies. This is not in a sexual anything. There's nothing sexual about this. This is super stupid. I feel super goofy doing it, but they will take a couple hundred dollars from me if I don't include it. So I'm doing it. Areolas? That's gross. Don't be gross. We can tell that this is meant to be a robe à la française because of the square neckline that appears on both garments. Obviously, there are a few things that are different about these two looks. This is a robe à la française. The squared off neckline is one of those clues. We'll get into some more. There are a few things going on here. This has just got to be a reference to the Margiela show from spring 1991, where he took 1950s ball gowns and cut them up the front to symbolize how 
in the 1950s after Christian Dior's new look debuted. It, it caused a lot of anger, especially among the second wave feminist community about how women were meant to be perceived. Margiela bought a number of these dresses from the 1950s at a flea market and then dyed them, added a couple of processes to them, and then literally cut them up the front so that they could fit onto his models as a layering piece for the runway. It was kind of like the models were like bursting out of this regressive feminine thing from the past. It's almost like Jacques Mousse is presenting these historical garments as if they're being viewed on a light table. Just the most substantial parts and cuts that make up the silhouette of the robe à la française. Just the visual hallmarks as the, the bones of the look. By the way, a light table is a flat table that emits a lot of light from up underneath it so that you can take garments that are too valuable to actually pick apart and just lay them on top of the light table. Then the light shines really brightly up through them and you're able to take a top over photograph of them so that you can see the structure of how it works on the inside. But hang on. You may be exclaiming. The front of these gowns don't look like the front of the historic gowns from that era. And yeah, I mean, different segments of ribbon are holding the bodice together with miniature slide buckles. Side by side, this doesn't look like a robe à la française until you consider the more casual jacket version of the robe à la française called the casaquin or casaquin or I, I don't know. So we have found casaquin jackets with this type of closure and in some cases these ribbons are found underneath the front to help provide the tension necessary to close the jackets around the bust. But this is Jacques Mousse, of course, so we're not just examining historic clothing here, we are taking historic clothing, or the idea of historic clothing, and turning it essentially into a lingerie. The slide buckle or tie motif also creates a visual that definitely looks like the back of a hospital gown, if we're being honest. And really, what could be more revealing than a hospital gown? That same detail is also seen on the few men that are in this show in the form of a vest and across the front of men's trousers. And that leads us into drawstrings. So like getting into an outfit from the 18th century is mostly just a process of tying a lot of different things around your waist. Jacques Mousse uses them here in the neckline of these particular looks, referencing the chemise à la reine, a cotton shift dress that Marie Antoinette popularized. It was actually kind of scandalous that she wore this. It was sort of like the equivalent of her like doing like an underwear only shoot. And before anybody gets all like, oh, big deal, that's not a big deal. They shouldn't make such a big deal out of that. Imagine Jill Biden doing that. Think about that. So the artist that painted this portrait was asked to remove it by the salon where he was going to exhibit it, but it started a huge trend of women wearing these cotton shifts as just a outfit. We, if we think about this historically, chemises were the first layer that was close to your body, right? These are the ones that would absorb all of the sweat and keep that sweat away from the expensive outer layers of silk. So the ones that peasants would wear especially would have drawstrings up by the neckline. Those, of course, were the ones that Marie Antoinette was wearing and what she posed in in that portrait because she was trying to idealize poverty and it's on it like it, it works all into this complete circle because the show is titled shushu which is a, a scrunchie and the idea of shushu does still apply to these drawstrings that go through clothes so that you can sense them up that's that's a shushu a shushu it is shushu I, I don't really know and drawstrings were also the primary technical feature in which skirts were worn in the 18th century but it was never one skirt but rather a, a layering of skirts which takes us to peignets Penier, noun, the things that you would put on underneath a skirt that would make your hips look huge. It's the, the historic uh, scaffolding of dresses. Door frames used to be actually constructed to be wider so that women wearing these could fit through them. But while designing this collection, Simone thought to himself, what if the penier was not just one layer of many layers that were meant to achieve a final effect of an outfit, but instead, what if they were incorporated directly into underwear? And that's what he did. And the penier shape definitely creates a modern take on broadening the hips to emphasize the waist in just a ton of these looks. It also happens in the last three looks, but no spoilers yet. But if the idea of a penier is just too extreme and large for this application, the less extreme version is what's known as a bum roll or a bum pad. In this look in particular, the Jacques Mousse take on a bum roll slash bum pad crawls up underneath the bust, turning an 18th century wardrobe fixture into a modern peplum. And that's what this is about, right? It's, a, it's all a more modernized, subtle version of 18th century hallmarks, which, I mean, 
gosh, that's an idea that's been done to death. There's a million designers that have attempted to take historical garments and then put them into the modern world in a coherent way. This is one of the more successful attempts that I've seen of that recently. Vivian Westwood's debut show in the fall 1981 season titled Pi, Pi, just, just Pirate. There was only one. This show serves as some visual inspiration here with poofy, almost, almost kind of obnoxious in the best way, shorts or underwear or <laughs> like, like, like diapers kind of. This shape and show theme generally went on to inspire a ton of other designers. Most obviously, John Galliano's spring 1993 show where you also got some sashes along tiny ruched underwear looking bottoms. Back to Simone's underwear, the, the shape of the underwear could possibly be inspired by 14th slash 15th century men's uh, braids, B-R-A-I-E-S. These men's braids were looning over the waistband in a scrunched up manner that looks like the other panier underwear that's on the women's looks as well, but it's also underwear on the outside of men's pants. Skirts have the drawstring of a panier layered with a petticoat as a focal motif, except the skirt is short and tiny, almost the height of some styles of peignets from this era, without the length of the rest of the skirt. Vivian Westwood's mini crinny from spring 1986 is definitely the source of inspiration here. Mini, mini crinny, you get it? Like this is a, a cage crinoline, the full size, and then you make it smaller so it's a mini crinny. Just making sure. Vivian Westwood, arguably most famous for her 18th century inspired work played with 18th century elements by combining them. You've seen her famous corsets, of course, with a stomacher. That's the, the piece of ornate fabric that filled the opening of a woman's bodice in the 18th century. This became the front of the corset itself rather than just layered on top of it as a separate piece. And the effect is seen very clearly when Viv's corsets have different prints on the area of the bodice that would be a stomacher or that the style lines emphasize that region of the corset. It's an approach that Jacques Mousse seems to take here. And an extension of Simone's previous layering techniques involving bras and tank tops like in this show or double pants like in this other show. We're now entering skirtception. Underneath some skirts we saw tights in a bright red color but also in a white with this graphic pink rose. This could be a few things but considering the major visual inspiration of this show I'm inclined to believe it is the same rose that Marie Antoinette is holding in her famous chemise portrait. Other skirts included tutus on men in particular, which is significant for a few different reasons. One, Marie Antoinette really loved the ballet. But when he was interviewed after the show, Simone said that Sarah Jessica Parker from Sex and the City inspired him. And I mean, I, I personally know almost nothing about Sex and the City, but even I am aware of these outfits. I'm not a stop along the way. I'm a destination. I know some stuff about Sex and the City. We now enter the shoes, square-toed ballet flats, which come in three different forms. It's a flat one, it's like a mule that you slip into a low heel and then a high heel. Then there's a high heel. These shoes are deeply inspired by point shoes in ballet. The front of the shoe is flat, like the platform of a point shoe, and the square shape is emulating the box. The Jacques Mousse shoes are even complete with the signature ballet flat bow, just like on real point shoes. But more importantly, what you may not know is that the bow in a ballet shoe is actually a drawstring that's used to tighten the opening. So more drawstring motif there. The bra top isn't going anywhere, and this season it's evolving with the addition of sleeves. Simone mentioned that this is about to become a staple at Jacques Mousse. While these may possibly take inspiration from the wedding dress of Princess Diana, these poofy sleeves along with the very poofy ball dresses are most likely from the legendary Jacques Demi movie, Donkey Skin, and the various ball gowns and large bulbous shapes within that movie. If you are not aware of Donkey Skin, holy shit, it is, the cra it is one of the craziest movies ever made. Every fashion designer is obsessed with this movie. If you have not watched Donkey Skin, you need to watch it. It's, uh, it's nuts. The last three looks, the French flat. You just got Franced. Share this with your friends to totally France them. These feature a modernized element of a key distinctive feature of a robe a la Francaise. Robings were a detail that was used to highlight the beautiful fabrics that royal he could afford through two box pleats at the back of a garment. You see here, it's just these awesome looking pleats that just shoot down the back of the dress. Jacques Mousse detaches those distinct motifs of historic fashion from the dresses and just lets them get 
blown around in the breeze. So yeah, the, the French flag, but also probably a reference to the legendary flag dress that Azadine and Alaya made for Jesse Norman, a spotlight moment for French fashion history. Simone is just like, he's super, super proud to be French. He, he says that he is obsessed with France. Jewelry this season is crucial to the overall story. We had some really great details like the lariat necklaces for men hanging down the back of a cutout blazer. My producer and wife is now telling me that I need to say this out loud for the SEO. Bad Bunny Met Gala. Are you ready for the Princess Diana part of this episode? I found this photo of the mood board that someone posted backstage from the Jacques Mousse show, and we're just gonna go through a few of these images and talk about why they're important. In the first Diana photo on the mood board, she is in Washington, D.C., wearing a white lace dress and sporting sapphire earrings. Okay, so sapphires are a super crucial gem in the British monarchy's history. That visual hallmark started when Prince Albert gifted a sapphire brooch that was surrounded by diamonds to Queen Victoria. A brooch in that style goes on to become a choker that Diana wore literally everywhere, even after her divorce. She, she wore it to galas and functions and just all over. But you may know this choker best from the revenge dress, which Simone interprets in costume jewelry with drop earrings to match. And I actually really like these earrings. There's no symbolism here, but the, the length and the weight at the end of the chain makes it where they're just kind of like buzzing around their head like bees. I really like that. Other jewelry from this show is the cherry necklaces and earrings, which to me feel, they're, they're not in the scene, but they feel like they're pulled out of the I want candy scene from the Marie Antoinette movie by Sofia Coppola. Diana's famous polka dot looks are brought into the show using a couple of different looks. And unless something has changed since the last time I was researching this photo, this is one of the few famous photos of Princess Diana where we don't actually know what designer she was wearing. And polka dots aren't new to the Jacques Mousse universe. It fits into Jacques Mousse's play with with geometric shapes. And this season is no different. There are tiny hoops that are asymmetrical with a circle hoop for one ear and a square hoop for the other. Another use of that square circle motif was on the edges of a new bag this season that looks like a brown paper lunch bag. We also see a new bag, but I could not find any information about it, so we're moving on. <laughs> Wide stripes. We can see that here in this photograph of Prince Harry and Prince William wearing striped play clothes. We also see that with Princess Diana wearing this very cool outfit that also involves white stripes. But these stripes are also found in the legendary Jacques Mousse Cabana Stripe show. And that may be of some substance here because the stripes seem to be towel-like. The underwear in these looks isn't really striped though. If we look closely, it resembles a gingham print, which Jacques Mousse has used in previous seasons to evoke kind of a tablecloth look meant for a picnic setting. A lot of the mood board images feature Diana wearing red, clearly a huge color for this collection. One of those looks features a red Christian Lacroix dress, which if you are not aware, Simone Port Jacques Mousse fucking loves Christian Lacroix. Christian Lacroix also was deeply inspired by 18th century fashion. He actually wrote a dissertation on the use of French fashion in 18th century French painting. Back to the stripes for a second. I still can't help but point out how similar the stripe looks are to a few looks from Christian Lacroix's spring 1988 couture show. And the, the skirt in particular looks an awful lot like the bulbous nature of this show and another bubble skirt that Princess Diana famously wore, but we're not tying anything to fact yet. That's, those are just my hunches. This curved coat has sort of become a visual part of Jacques Mousse's outerwear, but in case you ever forget that Jacques Mousse is a French brand, it's called the croissant coat. And something I do want to touch on, we don't really cover models at all on this channel, but it's a pretty star-studded runway here. Gigi, Vittoria, Kendall, Iman, Muna, and there, there's something about the density of supermodels in this show that speaks to royalty and status, and so that the tie into Versailles is very much there with kind of the, the, the Nepo baby idea of the models in this show. And also there's that great clip of uh, Gigi and Kendall riding off in the golf cart. Love that. And another thing, this photo from the promotional materials for this runway that came out beforehand is very similar to this photo of Ms. Cracker. Have a good night.